Hello, welcome if you are new to the podcast and welcome back if you've been hanging out with us for some time. You are appreciated. Our story in focus this week is about the eruption of Mount Nyagongo in the Democratic Republic of Congo. As part of the nine overlooked stories in this week's episode, we'll also touch on stories that range from Amnesty International's new report that sheds light on how indigenous people in Peru are being exposed to toxic substances. We'll go from there all the way to a massive data leak from a Japanese dating app. As your host, I bring you Overlook stories from all around the world. My name is Yemi, and you will see from this episode that the stories range from the good to the plain to the weird. All references are always linked in the blog so that you can find them and follow up and do some more digging on your own. The blog is going to be linked in our show notes as well as on our social media. Just check the link in the bio. As an announcement, we are also planning some changes to the schedule and style of this podcast starting in season three. Rather than the short weekly episodes, the plan is now to transition into a longer style episode that focuses and deep dives into a single overlook story. Let me know what you think about this. We're really, really excited for the change. With that said, let us get right into the stories for this week. The Galapagos Islands, which are located roughly 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that the organization has now described as a unique living museum and showcase of evolution and a melting pot of marine species. One of the most famous rock formations on the Galapagos Islands, called the Darwin's Arch, has now collapsed into the sea. Well, technically, the top of the arch has fallen into the sea as a result of natural erosion. So now the arch is no longer an arch, it's more like just two pillars. The iconic Darwin's Arch is a naturally formed bridge that has been beloved by tourists for so many years. The Ministry of Environment for Ecuador posted updated images of the structure on social media recently, and it now just consists of two pillars. The UNESCO World Heritage Site is known for its many endemic animal and planet species, and its famously inspired Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. It's almost fitting, really, if you think about it, that the arch has now evolved into pillars, or as it is now being called, the Pillars of Evolution. Amnesty International has said in a recent report called Failed State of Health, Health Emergency in Indigenous People in Espinar, Peru, that thousands of Peruvian indigenous people who live near mining projects are facing a health crisis after testing positive for high levels of metals and toxic substances. The organization carried out desk and field research in 11 indigenous communities in Espinar, which included analysis of metals and toxic substances in 150 people and water quality. The organization found levels of metals and toxic substances that are so high that it demonstrates that the health risk to which the communities are exposed must be addressed as an emergency. It also found that 115 samples of water used for human consumption tested positive for total chloroforms, which means that the water is neither clean nor safe. The report accused Peru's government of failing in its health obligations towards the Ka'ana indigenous people in southeast Espina province in the Costco region that is home to the country's most popular tourist attraction, Machu Picchu. Mining is big business in Peru. The country is one of the world's largest producer of copper, gold, silver, zinc, and lead. As a sector, mining accounted for 16% of Peru's private investment over the last decade, representing 60% of exports and generating 1.8 million direct and indirect jobs. Research chief Maria Jose Varamendi has urged health authorities to establish a permanent epidemiological surveillance program in Espinar to determine the total impact on the exposed population. Amnesty International said that the state recognizes that 10 million inhabitants, or close to a third of the population, are at risk of exposure to heavy metals, with more than 20% or 6.8 million people at risk from metalloids such as arsenic. Veramendi added that private companies have an obligation not to violate the human rights of populations, and the state has an essential responsibility to supervise 
corporate responsibility. The personal information of those who use the dating app Omiyai has likely been leaked due to unauthorized access to the operating company's server. The app's operator called Net Marketing Co. has said that the personal data of 1.71 million users who provided personal information between January 2018 and April 2021, including their names, face, um, date of birth, passports, and driver's licenses, could have been compromised. Credit card information was apparently not affected as it is processed separately through a financial institution. Net Marketing Co. said that it has not confirmed any use of the potentially leaked data by a third party. And just in case you were wondering, because I know you were, the name Umiai is based on the Japanese word for matchmaking. Mount Niragongo, which is located in the Democratic Republic of Congo, has erupted for the first time in nearly two decades. It is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. The eruption reportedly turned the night sky red and sent lava onto a major highway even as the rightfully panicked residents of Goma, a nearby city of nearly 2 million people, tried to escape. Since the original eruption on May the 25th, there have been reports of casualties as people tried to escape and some children have gotten lost in the chaos. Furthermore, as of May the 30th, CNN has now reported that 92 additional earthquakes and tremors have been recorded. Goma is the capital of North Kivu province and is located at the edge of Lake Kivu on the DRC's border with Rwanda. According to official projections from the United Nations, the World Bank, and others, the city is home to approximately 670,000 people. However, the numbers vary based on the source, and some have actually estimated that the amount of people could be closer to 2 million. This is scary stuff, and except you have been in the region of an erupting volcano, it is very hard to even imagine what the nearby residents are going through and the chaos of thousands of people trying to escape at the same time. Mount Inagongo's last eruption was in 2002. At that time, the eruption left hundreds dead and coated the airport runway in lava. More than 100,000 people were left homeless in the aftermath, and the memories of the 2002 eruptions are understandably adding to the fears right now in Goma. The government said that an evacuation plan is being activated, and Rwandan immigration authorities reported that about 3,000 people had already officially crossed over from Congo to escape the eruption. Notably, the volcano that is erupting is close to Virunga National Park, which is home to some of the very last mountain gorillas in the world. In another twist, scientists have now said that the underground magma has been flowing towards Lake Kivu ever since this recent eruption. This is concerning because if an eruption from under the lake, otherwise called a limnic eruption occurs, it would pose a very rare but potentially catastrophic risk to the residents of Goma. A limnic eruption would release dissolved gases that have accumulated at the depths of the lake, and these gases could then displace the oxygen in the air and affect breathing, potentially causing asphyxiation. This rare event has happened before. It happened in Cameroon in the year 1986. Lake Nios released dissolved carbon dioxide into the air after a landslide. The cloud of the invisible and odorless CO2 caused an estimated 1,800 people in nearby villages to asphyxiate. Since there is a significant amount of uncertainty about the potential for limnic eruption from Lake Kivu, residents who have not left yet are now being urged to evacuate. As of when this episode was recorded on Sunday, May 30th, the story was still evolving. The entire contents of Stephen Hawking's office at Cambridge, including his communications equipment, memorabilia, bets he made on scientific databases and office furniture will be partly digitized and all preserved for future generations under an agreement between the Cambridge University Library, the Science Museum Group, and the UK government. Around 10,000 pages of his papers will remain at Cambridge, as well as a large collection of photographs with figures such as Pope Francis and letters to and from former US President Bill Clinton and former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. His children expressed support that their father's life's work would benefit generations to come. 
Stephen Hawking famously forged a very groundbreaking career in theoretical physics. He died in 2018 at the age of 76 after being diagnosed with ALS at the age of 21. Spain's Postal Service is feeling a backlash from its failed attempt to highlight racial inequality using stamps. State-owned Correa's Espana recently issued a set of four stamps in different skin color tones. So far, so good. However, the darker stamps were worth less, while the lighter stamps were worth more. The lightest color cost 1.6 euros or $1.95, while the darkest stamp cost 0. 0.70 euros or just 85 US dollar or just 85 cents. The so-called equality stamps were introduced on the anniversary of George Floyd's death. Corios Espana said that the stamps reflect an unfair and painful reality that should not be allowed, and that every letter or parcel sent with them would send a message against racial inequality. Uh, as you can imagine, valuing lighter tone stamps as worth more was at the very least tone deaf. But it definitely achieved its goal to, in quotes, shine a light on racial inequality and promote diversity, inclusion, and equal rights. It did that, but in a backwards and ironic way. It's one of those cases where you look and go, Hun, I don't think that means what you think it means. And to me, to CJ, a historian who heads the government's council for the elimination of racial or ethnic discrimination, has urged the Postal Service to stop selling the stamps. He tweeted, A campaign that outrages those that it claims to defend is always a mistake. I agree. Corios Espana has said that it would make no comment on the controversy. I mean, you'd have to think that those stamps went through various levels of approval and somebody, somebody would have picked up on it. Apparently not. The crux of this next story, in the English city of Liverpool, was caught after posting a picture of himself holding a block of Stilton cheese. Carl Stewart, who is age 39, was sentenced to 13 years and 6 months in prison at Liverpool Crown Court last week after he pleaded guilty to conspiracy to supply a number of hard drugs and to transferring criminal property. While that's all well and good, the main story that at least I want to focus on is to highlight just how the police caught him. So they got the evidence that they needed from a picture that he shared of himself holding a small block of creamy Stilton cheese. The cheese must be good. The police were able to analyze his palm and fingerprints just from the photo that he posted on a chat called EncroChat. EncroChat is an encrypted chat service. I mean, the use of that level of advanced technology is mind-blowing. That a picture, just a picture posted on an app, could be analyzed enough to get fingerprints is just like, wow. That's just wow. In Canada, the remains of 215 children, some as young as 3 years old, were found at the site of a former residential school for Indigenous children. The children were students at the Kamaloos Indian Residential School in British Columbia that closed in the year 1978. According to the Te Kwamlup Te Shekwampek Nation, a new release by Chief Rosa and Kashmir, which can be found through the second link in the references for this story on the blog, announced the discovery saying that the remains were found after working with a ground-penetrating radar specialist to confirm the mass grave at the Kamaloops Indian Residential School. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said that the discovery was heartbreaking. He referred to the discovery as a painful reminder of that dark and shameful chapter in Canada's history. The residential school system in Canada served as a mandatory boarding school for Indigenous youth and were run by churches and the federal government for more than 150 years during the 19th and 20th centuries. To say the very, very least, the conditions were poor and these children, who are forcibly taken from their homes, were then forced to let go of their culture, history, and traditions. The history and trauma from the Canadian residential school system is long and has a lot more detail that can be covered in our short summary episodes. 
There are a lot of documentaries on the Canadian residential school system and the generational issues that it has caused. These recent heartbreaking findings are only preliminary, and that is scary. The school grounds have not even been scanned in their entirety. While it is not clear when or how these children died, the preliminary findings will be released in a report set for mid-June 2021. According to the statement from the Teklam Loops Teisha Wepek Nation, the findings will hopefully hopefully bring some closure to the lives lost and to their home communities. Our final story this week is a little bit of a mind twister. We have in this podcast covered issues with WhatsApp having data leaks and issues. And in fact, the story was so huge that a lot of people actually left WhatsApp a few months ago and just transitioned to other instant messaging services. Now, as a little bit of a mind twister, WhatsApp has sued the Indian government in a bid to block new rules it says will lead to mass surveillance by forcing social media platforms to hand over private information about their users. India has recently issued strict new rules for Facebook, Twitter, and other social platforms weeks after the country's government attempted to pressure Twitter to take down accounts that it deemed incendiary. Of the many requirements from the new rules, the rule that WhatsApp has apparently taken the most issue with is one that would require companies to trace the first originator of messages if asked by authorities. The government has said that such requests would only be made in relation to a serious crime, but the company is concerned that this move would effectively end any guarantee of user privacy by requiring the platform to keep track of every single message. According to WhatsApp, this would essentially break end-to-end encryption and fundamentally undermine people's rights to privacy. India is WhatsApp's biggest market. There, it has about 400 million users. And while Facebook and WhatsApp have definitely had their fair share of controversies, I'm really interested in what you think the implications of this are for WhatsApp and encryption across social media platforms or software apps if WhatsApp actually loses this case. Would countries, for example, be able to use this as a case for breaking encryption in, say, Apple's iOS devices? Share your thoughts in the comment section. And with that being said, I want to wish you a fantastic, fantastic week. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to tune in every week for a new episode. Overlooked is a Tunica Media production, which also includes shows like Africa in My Kitchen, with more on the way. So follow Tunica Media on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to be in the loop. Until next time, have yourself a great week ahead.